Chapter Fourteen of Tarzan of the Apes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Fourteen. At the Mercy of the Jungle. After Clayton had plunged into the jungle, the sailors, mutineers of the Arrow, fell into a discussion of their next step, but on one point all were agreed that they should hasten to put off to the anchored Arrow, where they could at least be safe from the spears of their unseen foe. And so, while Jane Porter and Esmeralda were barricading themselves within the cabin, the cowardly crew of cutthroats were pulling rapidly for their ship in the two boats that had brought them ashore. So much had Tarzan seen that day that his head was in a whirl of wonder, but the most wonderful sight of all to him was the face of the beautiful white girl. Here at last was one of his own kind, of that he was positive, and the young man and the two old men, they too were much as he had pictured his own people to be. But doubtless they were as ferocious and cruel as other men he had seen. The fact that they alone of all the party were unarmed might account for the fact that they had killed no one. They might be very different if provided with weapons. Tarzan had seen the young man pick up the fallen revolver of the wounded Snipes and hide it away in his breast, and he had also seen him slip it cautiously to the girl as she entered the cabin door. He did not understand anything of the motives behind all that he had seen, but somehow Intuitively he liked the young man and the two old men, and for the girl he had a strange longing which he scarcely understood. As for the big black woman, she was evidently connected in some way to the girl, and so he liked her also. For the sailors, and especially Snipes, he had developed a great hatred. He knew by their threatening gestures and by the expression upon their evil faces that they were enemies of the others of the party and so he decided to watch closely. Tarzan wondered why the men had gone into the jungle, nor did it ever occur to him that one could become lost in that maze of undergrowth, which to him was as simple as is the main street of your own home town to you. When he saw the sailors row away toward the ship, and knew that the girl and her companion were safe in his cabin, Tarzan decided to follow the young man into the jungle and learn what his errand might be. He swung off rapidly in the direction taken by Clayton, and in a short time heard faintly in the distance the now only occasional calls of the Englishman to his friends. Presently Tarzan came up with the white man, who, almost fagged, was leaning against a tree wiping the perspiration from his forehead. The ape-man, hiding safe behind a screen of foliage, sat watching this new specimen of his own race intently. At intervals Clayton called aloud, and finally it came to Tarzan that he was searching for the old man. Tarzan was on the point of going off to look for them himself, when he caught the yellow glint of a sleek hide moving cautiously through the jungle toward Clayton. It was Sheeta, the leopard. Now Tarzan heard the soft bending of grasses, and wondered why the young white man was not warned. Could it be he had failed to note the loud warning? Never before had Tarzan known Sheeta to be so clumsy. No, the white man did not hear. Sheeta was crouching for the spring, and then, shrill and horrible, there rose from the stillness of the jungle the awful cry of the challenging ape, and Sheeta turned, crashing into the underbrush. Clayton came to his feet with a start. His blood ran cold. Never in all his life had so fearful a sound smote upon his ears. He was no coward, but if ever man felt the icy fingers of fear upon his heart, William Cecil Clayton, eldest son of Lord Greystoke of England, did that day in the fastness of the African jungle. The noise of some great body crashing through the underbrush so close beside him, and the sound of that blood-curdling shriek from above, tested Clayton's courage to the limit, but he could not know that it was to that very voice he owed his life nor that the creature who hurled it forth was his own cousin, the real Lord Greystoke. The afternoon was drawing to a close, 
and Clayton, disheartened and discouraged, was in a terrible quandary as to the proper course to pursue, whether to keep on in search of Professor Porter, at the almost certain risk of his own death in the jungle by night, or to return to the cabin where he might at least serve to protect Jane from the perils which confronted her on all sides. He did not wish to return to camp without her father. Still more, he shrank from the thought of leaving her alone and unprotected in the hands of the mutineers of the Arrow, or to the hundred unknown dangers of the jungle. Possibly, too, he thought, the professor and Philander might have returned to camp. Yes, that was more than likely. At least he would return and see, before he continued what seemed to be a most fruitless quest. And so he started, stumbling back through the thick and matted underbrush in the direction that he thought the cabin lay. To Tarzan's surprise the young man was heading farther into the jungle in the general direction of Mabonga's village, and the shrewd young ape-man was convinced that he was lost. To Tarzan this was scarcely incomprehensible. His judgment told him that no man would venture toward the village of the cruel blacks armed only with a spear which, from the awkward way in which he carried it, was evidently an unaccustomed weapon to this white man. Nor was he following the trail of the old men. That they had crossed and left long since, though it had been fresh and plain before Tarzan's eyes. Tarzan was perplexed. The fierce jungle would make easy prey of this unprotected stranger in a very short time if he were not guided quickly to the beach. Yes, there was Numa, the lion, even now, stalking the white man a dozen paces to the right. Clayton heard the great body paralleling his course, and now there rose upon the evening air the beast's thunderous roar. The man stopped with upraised spear and faced the brush from which issued the awful sound. The shadows were deepening, darkness was settling in. God! To die here alone, beneath the fangs of wild beasts, to be torn and rended, to feel the hot breath of the brute on his face as the great paw crushed down on his breast. For a moment all was still. Clayton stood rigid, with raised spear. Presently a faint rustling of the bush apprised him of the stealthy creeping of the thing behind. It was gathering for the spring. At last he saw it, not twenty feet away, the long, lithe, muscular body and tawny head of a huge black-maned lion. The beast was upon its belly, moving forward very slowly. As its eyes met Clayton's it stopped, and deliberately, cautiously, gathered its hind quarters behind it. In agony the man watched, fearful to launch his spear, powerless to fly. He heard a noise in the tree above him. Some new danger, he thought, but he dared not take his eyes from the yellow-green orbs before him. There was a sharp twang, as of a broken banjo string, and at the same instant an arrow appeared in the yellow hide of the crouching lion. With a roar of pain and anger the beast sprang, but somehow Clayton stumbled to one side and as he turned again to face the infuriated king of beasts, he was appalled at the sight which confronted him. Almost simultaneously with the lion's turning to renew the attack, a half-naked giant dropped from the tree above squarely on the brute's back. With lightning speed an arm that was banded layers of iron muscle encircled the huge neck, and the great beast was raised from behind, roaring and pawing the air, raised as easily as Clayton would have lifted a pet dog. The scene he witnessed there in the twilight depths of the African jungle was burned forever into the Englishman's brain. The man before him was the embodiment of physical perfection and giant strength, yet it was not upon these he depended in his battle with the great cat, for mighty as were his muscles they were as nothing by comparison with Numa's. To his agility, to his brain and to his long keen knife he owed his supremacy. His right arm encircled the lion's neck, while the left hand plunged the knife time and again into the unprotected side behind the left shoulder. The infuriated beast pulled up and backwards until he stood upon his hind legs, struggled impotently in this unnatural position. Had the battle been of a few seconds longer duration the outcome might have been different 
but it was all accomplished so quickly that the line had scarce time to recover from the confusion of its surprise ere it sank lifeless to the ground. Then the strange figure which had vanquished it stood erect upon the carcass, and throwing back the wild and handsome head, gave out the fearsome cry which a few moments earlier had so startled Clayton. Before him he saw the figure of a young man, naked except for a loincloth and a few barbaric ornaments about his arms and legs, on the breast a priceless diamond locket gleaming against a smooth brown skin. The hunting knife had been returned to its homely sheath, and the man was gathering up his bow and quiver from where he had tossed them when he leaped to attack the lion. Clayton spoke to the stranger in English, thanking him for his brave rescue, and complimenting him on the wondrous strength and dexterity he had displayed, but the only answer was a steady stare and a faint shrug of the mighty shoulders, which might betoken either disparagement of the service rendered or ignorance of Clayton's language. When the bow and quiver had been slung to his back, the wild man, for such Clayton now thought him, once more drew his knife and deftly carved a dozen large strips of meat from the lion's carcass. Then, squatting upon his haunches, he proceeded to eat, first motioning Clayton to join him. The strong white teeth sank into the raw and dripping flesh in apparent relish of the meal, but Clayton could not bring himself to share the uncooked meat with this strange host. Instead he watched him, and presently there dawned upon him the conviction that this was Tarzan of the Apes, whose notice he had seen posted upon the cabin door that morning. If so, he must speak English. Again Clayton attempted speech with the ape-man, but the replies, now vocal, were in a strange tongue, which resembled the chattering of monkeys mingled with the growling of some wild beast. No, this could not be Tarzan of the apes, for it was very evident that he was an utter stranger to English. When Tarzan had completed his repast, he rose, and pointing in a very different direction from that which Clayton had been pursuing, started off through the jungle toward the point he had indicated. Clayton, bewildered and confused, hesitated to follow him, for he thought he was but being led more deeply into the mazes of the forest, but the ape-man, seeing him disinclined to follow, returned, and grasping him by the coat, dragged him along until he was convinced that Clayton understood what was required of him. Then he left him to follow voluntarily. The Englishman, finally concluding that he was a prisoner, saw no alternative open but to accompany his captor, and thus they travelled slowly through the jungle while the sable mantle of the impenetrable forest night fell about them, and the stealthy footfalls of padded claws mingled with the breaking of twigs, and the wild calls of the savage life that Clayton felt closing in upon him. Suddenly Clayton heard the faint report of a firearm, a single shot, and then silence. In the cabin by the beach two thoroughly terrified women clung to each other as they crouched upon the low bench in the gathering darkness. The negress sobbed hysterically, bemoaning the evil day that had witnessed her departure from her dear Maryland, while the white girl, dry-eyed and outwardly calm, was torn by inward fears and forebodings. She feared not more for herself than for the three men whom she knew to be wandering in the abysmal depths of the savage jungle, from which she now heard issuing the almost incessant shrieks and roars, barkings and growlings of its terrifying and fearsome denizens, as they sought their prey. And now there came the sound of a heavy body brushing against the side of the cabin. She could hear the great padded paws upon the ground outside. For an instant all was silence. Even the bedlam of the forest died to a faint murmur. Then she distinctly heard the beast outside sniffing at the door, not two feet from where she crouched. Instinctively the girl shuddered and shrank closer to the black woman. Hush, she whispered. Hush, Esmeralda, for the woman's sobs and groans seemed to have attracted the thing that stalked there just beyond the thin wall. A gentle scratching sound was heard on the door. The brute tried to force an entrance, but presently this ceased, and again she heard the great pads creeping stealthily around the cabin. Again they stopped, 
beneath the window on which the terrified eyes of the girl now glued themselves. God, she murmured, for now, silhouetted against the moonlit sky beyond, she saw framed in the tiny square of the latticed window the head of a huge lioness. The gleaming eyes were fixed upon her in intent ferocity. Look, Esmeralda, she whispered. For God's sake, what shall we do? Look, quick, the window! Esmeralda, cowering still closer to her mistress, took one frightened glance toward the little square of moonlight, just as the lioness emitted a low, savage snarl. The sight that met the poor woman's eyes was too much for the already overstrung nerves. "'Oh, Gabrielle!' she shrieked, and slid to the floor an inert and senseless mass. For what seemed an eternity the great brute stood with its forepaws upon the sill, glaring into the little room. Presently it tried the strength of the lattice with its great talons. The girl had almost ceased to breathe, when to her relief the head disappeared, and she heard the brute's footsteps leaving the window. But now they came to the door again, and once more the scratching commenced, this time with increasing force until the great beast was tearing at the massive panels in a perfect frenzy of eagerness to seize its defenceless victims. Could Jane have known the immense strength of that door? Built piece by piece, she would have felt less fear of the lioness reaching her by this avenue. Little did John Clayton imagine when he fashioned that crude but mighty portal that one day, twenty years later, it would shield a fair American girl, then unborn, from the teeth and talons of a man-eater. For fully twenty minutes the brute alternately sniffed and tore at the door, occasionally giving voice to a wild, savage cry of baffled rage. At length, however, she gave up the attempt, and Jane heard her returning toward the window beneath which she paused for an instant, and then launched her great weight against the time-worn lattice. The girl heard the wooden rods groan beneath the impact, but they held, and the huge body dropped back to the ground below. Again and again the lioness repeated these tactics, until finally the horrified prisoner within saw a portion of the lattice give way, and in an instant one great paw and the head of the animal were thrust within the room. Slowly the powerful neck and shoulders spread the bars apart, and the lithe body protruded farther and farther into the room. As in a trance the girl rose, her hand upon her breast, wide eyes staring horror-stricken into the snarling face of the beast scarce ten feet from her. At her feet lay the prostrate form of the negress. If she could but arouse her, their combined efforts might possibly avail to beat back the fierce and bloodthirsty intruder. Jane stooped to grasp the black woman by the shoulder. Roughly she shook her. "'Esmeralda! Esmeralda!' she cried. "'Help me, or we are lost!' Esmeralda opened her eyes. The first object they encountered was the dripping fangs of the hungry lioness. With a horrified scream the poor woman rose to her hands and knees, and in this position scurried across the room, shrieking, "'Oh, Gabrielle! Oh, Gabrielle!' at the top of her lungs. Esmeralda weighed some two hundred and eighty pounds, and her extreme haste, added to her extreme corpulency, produced a most amazing result when Esmeralda elected to travel on all fours. For a moment the lioness remained quiet with intense gaze directed upon the flitting Esmeralda, whose goal appeared to be the cupboard, into which she attempted to propel her huge bulk, but as the shells were but nine or ten inches apart, she only succeeded in getting her head in, whereupon, with a final screech, which paled the jungle noises into insignificance, she fainted once again. With the subsidence of Esmeralda, the lioness renewed her efforts to wriggle her huge bulk through the weakening lattice. The girl, standing pale and rigid against the farther wall, sought with ever-increasing terror for some loophole of escape. Suddenly her hand, tight-pressed against her bosom, felt the hard outline of the revolver that Clayton had left with her earlier in the day. Quickly she snatched it from its hiding-place and leveling it full at the lioness's face, pulled the trigger. There was a flash of flame, the roar of the discharge, 
and an answering roar of pain and anger from the beast. Jane Porter saw the great form disappear from the window, and then she too fainted, the revolver falling at her side. But Sabor was not killed. The bullet had but inflicted a painful wound in one of the great shoulders. It was the surprise at the blinding flash and the deafening roar that had caused her hasty but temporary retreat. In another instant she was back at the lattice, and with renewed fury was clawing at the aperture but with lessened effect, since the wounded member was almost useless. She saw her prey, the two women, lying senseless upon the floor. There was no longer any resistance to be overcome. Her meat lay before her, and Sabre had only to worm her way through the lattice to claim it. Slowly she forced her great bulk, inch by inch, through the opening. Now her head was through, now one great forearm and shoulder. Carefully she drew up the wounded member to insinuate it gently beyond the tight-pressing bars. A moment more, and both shoulders through, the long, sinuous body and the narrow hips would glide quickly after. It was on this sight that Jane Porter again opened her eyes. End of chapter